today I'll speak about BV language. And of course, while I'm, so you can, you can record. Yes. So while I'm, so before, uh, say yesterday, I wanted to explain how great this language is and that it arises everything, everywhere. And uh, how much things you can do using this language. However, in preparing to this talk, <clears throat> I found that it's hard to understand the origin of this language. And when I started to think about the origin of this language, I found kind of a pain. And uh, that's why the topic would be results and pain. Uh, Andy, you're out of focus. Ah, okay. It's another pain. You see, ah, being out of focus. Now it's good. Uh -huh. Okay. So once again, results and pain. And then I started, you know, when somebody talks to you, giving a talk, he wants to show how smart he is, how he solved these, these, these problems and how he can solve these, these, these problems. And he never talks about the problems and, and pain. However, if somebody wants to transfer real knowledge to listeners, he should not only say about results, but also about pain. And pain is either a limitation of the technique, set of axioms, whatever, construction. Uh, also about uh, where does it come from? So I uh, came from uh, two sources, from physics and mathematics. In physics, I came from uh, fundamental particles. So people were trying to understand what is the origin of things? So atoms are made by, so molecules are made out of atoms. Atoms are made uh, out of nuclei and uh, electrons. Okay. Nuclei are made by protons and, and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made out of quarks. That's, what, that's where we are right now. Then there are conjectural theories that quarks themselves are made out of strings, okay? So people try to go to the fundamental understanding. So there is also the similar hierarchy that happens in mathematics. So first people described sets. Then they described the, the and uh, there was a man called Cantor who was thinking about uh, what is the number of elements in the set. He found that there is infinity, infinity of infinities. And uh, finally he got crazy. He was criticized by French people. Uh, finally, he was put to academia in Germany and to clinic in the same Germany and being continuously criticized by French mathematicians, he finally died from depression. So his name was Kanto. Okay, so while he basically killed himself thinking about infinities, people, people went to sets, maps and structures. So simple structure on the set was something like a ring or a Lie algebra, something like this. And from ring, people moved to manifolds.
Then French mathematicians came again, now with good intentions. They are not always coming with bad intentions to kill you. Sometimes they are coming with good intentions and good ideas. But by the way, there are also, I think it was Maclean, who was not French mathematician, but he moved to, to the same direction. So they said, no, we are not going to talk about sets with the structure, like multiplication, bracket, etc. We go to the level of categories. So the new thing is an object. And uh, we are forgetting the notion of an element. We have just morphisms of the objects. Okay, good. So we come to the notion of category. And the notion of object was considered as being completely outdated. Okay? And since object <coughs> is outdated, we study categories. Great. Then after studying of categories, People came, so here is a level of categories. And then people came to the notion from categories. So first they studied categories of manifolds. And then they went to categories of sheaves on the manifolds. And then they went to categories themselves. And then they move to differential graded categories. Okay, so now differential graded categories. So I know a person uh, in Russia called Dmitry Arlov. I also know Bondel, Alexei Bondel. Who advocate this point of view? And actually, they found <coughs> that mirror manifolds are the same if you consider them in this framework. So it is great. So we are coming, coming, coming here. And it seems that we are making enormous progress. However, what I found is that in this progress, there is uh, something that's not that right. Namely, you start to think about differential graded categories. So you actually have a collection of morphisms. You have composition. And you have differential. Since it's a differential graded category. So First, you think that composition of morphism is associated. Then we know that if we have such thing, like differentials and associative composition of morphisms, we can move from it to so-called A infinity category where composition of morphisms is not associated. Actually, you replace the original morphisms <coughs> to complex of morphisms, and then uh, you contract something. And in A infinity, this multiplication 
of morphisms. Obey the following rule. Q of M2, I, I put it with the tilde. So there is a higher operation. Let's call it associativity three. And here, there is a new thing. I'll write it this way. Yes, there was a higher operation that I, that I call associativity three. And uh, here I have commutator with associativity three. Because uh, it depends on M2, M2, M2. And so on. Then, how can you, you see, it's still a line. Then, how can you take into account all this? The proper way to take into account it is to consider non-commutative vector field. And I'll talk about this later on. That is moreover, that is homological. But now you see, tricky thing is that non-commutative homological vector field is a vector field, vector field somewhere. First of all, we could embed it, and I also talk about it using large M construction in the supercommutative homological vector field. And then this homological vector field is a field somewhere. First, you say that's a field on the formal disk. But then you understand that this should be generalized to homological field on a manifold. And this is the pain that is actually not my pain. It's not the pain that I'm going to, to talk in the, at the moment. We see the loop in notations. We started from manifolds. We generalized, 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 going to categories. And we came back again to something that is a manifold. So instead of going to fundamental ingredients of mathematics, look, they're actually fundamental ingredients in mathematics because uh, everything, people thought everything would be formulated in terms of differential graded categories. However, you're making a loop. Um, uh, and the, is, is the formula written co correctly for, for, for the, the, yes, this one? I, or I, I don't understand it, I guess. So S? Yes. So here we have morphism. Ah. Yes. Thank you. So morphisms are, generalized morphisms are M tilde. Yes, thank you. It's because I'm a bit nervous writing this. Now a formula is correct. Ah, so M, M tilde is kind of all of it together. No, no, M tilde is a single morphism. But it takes arbitrary many inputs. So morphism, so M tilde, so this thing has mm -hmm. many inputs. The inputs here are morphisms. So let me write this formula again. Mm -hmm. So you have morphism. So before you have morphism M. And there was a notion of composition. 
of morphine. Mm -hmm. Okay? And you can, or maybe you correct me properly. And then you, thank you. And then you compose. So you see, see, my idea it was correct. However, maybe I wrote the wrong formula. So you have morphine. You have composition of morphine. And this thing is associated. Was associated. So, so you are right. So you are right. It should not be morphemes that I wrote here. It should be comp. Comp two. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So here, so here is comp, mm -hmm. and we know that compositions are associated. So here we have a diagram on compositions, and we put here and we put here uh, two compositions. Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, we are multiplying I'm sorry. Pasha, thank you. Mm -hmm. You see, it's uh, so this is composition of morphism. So there is associativity of compositions of morphism. So it is the main uh, rule that we can compose morphism in this way, and we can also compose morphisms in another way. Thank you, Pasha. Okay, I am sorry, but So this is this composition and this composition, okay? And now this difference is what? This difference is the following thing, is us two applied to compositions. One second. And here I am coming to the fact that this difference, so one second, I'll, I, I'll, I'll, find, I'll, I'll make it properly. So here this thing is exact. So you are right. So here, so here is the composition. One second. I'll make it right. Well, I, I'll try to derive it here. So here, so here is composition. Here is composition. I can compose them in a different way. So the result is a new operation mm. that I'll call composition. Three. It was composition two.
And the result was Q applied to what? Composition three, M1, M2, M3, M. Okay, so so this equation is understood in the following way that That composition, that uh, here is composition, here is Q, here is also composition. So, so, so it's kind of quadratic equation. And uh, you see, I'm hesitating a bit. So one can write this quadratic equation as the fact that uh, compositions form a homological vector field. So Q plus composition two plus composition three plus etc. that this thing in some sense square to zero. Because Q is going from morphism to morphism, this is going from two morphism to morphism, etc. So, so what is the so when I say homological vector field, what do I mean? I mean consider the disk. where morphisms are non-commutative coordinates. So if morphisms are non-commutative coordinates, then compositions may be considered as Taylor coefficients of a vector field. That is non-commutative. And so it is a vector field on a non-commutative space. So actually, This composition from the point of view of the vector field may be understood in the opposite way that you take a morphism and uh, go to the tensor product of two morphisms, of three morphisms, etc. So composition M may be considered as a map that takes M actually and doable and does this so <clears throat> so this vector field is composition d over dm and here there are some elements of M. So I call it dual. Yes, so th th this is how one can write it. And this vector field should square to zero. Then it will be possible to embed these vector fields in the, into the homological vector field. So, so this is how things should go. 
So this, so, so together with composition, we have a higher composition. And this equation is the first equation that you come in computing this Q, Q plus comp two plus comp three square. We, we will discuss it in more detail later. However, here I just want to, to mention the following interesting fact that starting with categories, going to differential categories, going to a infinity categories, where we have higher compositions of morphisms, embedding it into homological vector fields on the supercommutative space, all this way down, we come back to the manifold itself. I am sorry for uh, unclarity, Pasha. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. Thank, thank you. Uh, what is the sort of main example? Uh, and, and, or, or are you going to say Fukaya category? Yes, in particular Fukaya category, but it's not the main example. It's kind of the mm -hmm. first example that people found. Mm -hmm. The main example, Pasha, you know, okay? When you are trying to multiply uh, co-cycles. No, uh, so uh, actually, I'm interested in example of in. I know examples of infinity it's algebra, okay. but you, you are Fukai talking about L. Okay. Fukai, Fukai category, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is finite linear example of this. And uh, you see, I told you here. I announced that here is some kind n to infinity limit. So this thing considered as a linear algebra may be embedded using this large N in the homological vector field. And actually, Pasha, you asked about main example. That was again a good question. And I told you Fukai categories, and then I thought a little bit. The main example and the basic example is, of course, category of complexes. And I understand complexes not as something made out of sheaves, something very fancy. No, complex is just a Z2 graded vector space. And, mor and morphisms are just linear operators, okay? Things that you study during the first year at university, linear operators linear operators. And when I say Q applies there, it is the adjoint Q because it's not just linear operators. It's linear operators between complexes. Okay? And then it turns out that if you would like to contract a cyclic subcomplex, you get all this. So actually, Pasha, once again, good question. Thank you very much. No, so, sorry, what, what, what's your, what's the example again? So what are the objects? What so, are the morphisms? Objects are complexes, just abstract complexes, finite dimensional complexes. Okay. Nothing fancy. Mm -hmm. The morphisms are linear operators. Nothing fancy. But chain maps or any, any linear maps? Any linear maps. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important, any linear map. Because what you call chain maps are closed morph, are closed linear operators. Mm -hmm. And the, in order to have differential on morphisms, we should consider just linear maps. It's easier to consider linear maps. And uh, it is known that people were confused before. When people were thinking about morphisms of complexes, they thought about uh, they thought about uh, morphisms that preserve differential. That is also a linear map. Actually, they should think of morphisms 
as some, as something that is a complex again. And that's why the linear map of complexes are also a complex. That we may call a joint complex because uh, the differential there is differential from the left and differential from the right. And uh, so it is the simplest DG category, as you can as you can prove. Mm -hmm. It's in the linear algebra. And okay, so I'm making uh, I'm writing wrong formulas. So I apologize. But if I apologize, I would also like to criticize. I'd like to criticize the teaching of linear algebra who completely forget to teach complexes and morphs between complexes. They are mostly teaching uh, how to diagonalize a mission operator and how to write a Jordan law. No, it's good, but they forget something. They forget that uh, linear uh, spaces are naturally complexes. And what they call linear space is actually a complex with zero differential. Sitting and uh, sitting is the same, uh, is only graded called zero. It's very natural generalization. And if you consider this thing, you can write, you can run all this story and everything would be finite, finite dimensional, etc. Linear algebra. And when you come to Fukai category, you, you will say, oh, this thing is much more complicated. Objects are, okay, sheaves of Lagrangian, some manifolds, how can we get them? We need to study them on a manifold. Morphisms, they say morphisms are also complicated because <coughs> if Lagrangian <coughs> submanifolds intersect at a point, it's okay. What if they don't intersect as a point? What is the morphism from the object to itself? Self intersection of Lagrangian submanifold. You need to think about it in terms of some resolvent. You say that this is like differential forms on Lagrangian submanifold and all this. So it is very complicated example. Okay. However, there is simpler example. Actually, these simpler examples could be seen at least partial, partially. Okay. You are right. From you, you can see it from Fukaya, but uh, sometimes you can see them uh, if you study compositions of exts. When you study compositions of exts, and you use the resolvent of finite size in algebraic geometry, and I would prefer to do it on the projective spaces, you see exactly linear algebra of uh, modules over the ring and uh, they are equivalent to vector spaces, etc. But still, even this is too complicated. Linear algebra that are modules of a field, okay, of a field, say field C. What is the simpler thing that you can imagine? So you may think about it so what is a field? Field is a point. So point is also a manifold, right? What is the vector space? Vector space is a vector bundle over a point. Great. These vector bundles have a, a natural characterization. You may call it C0, okay? Zero's chain class. It's, it's a rank, okay? So you should never forget about point, okay? By the way, while I'm answering this question, 
I would expect the following question from you, Pasha. Why just a point? So with a point, we have linear algebra of complexes. What if we will have double point, triple point, etc.? What it will be? What would be proper category in this case? I don't know. It's interesting to study. So it's an equation of the simplest example. And now, what I'd like to stress is that here we are making a loop. And uh, you know, when we, when we make a loop, here it is like to have a loop in time. People were thinking about time machine. In time machine, you say, you do this because you have this history. You do this because you have this history. But sometimes you have a loop. And you have many, many things from science fiction when uh, people are playing with these loops, how fun it is, how counterintuitive it is. Okay? So here, what I, what I try to explain you it's also a loop. In the search of fundamental language, we are making a loop. So it hits our reasoning. It's counterintuitive. From manifold, okay, manifold with the homological vector field, it's natural generalization. We go further to category, to differential graded category, yeah, and come back. Loop. Loop of origin. We used to think in the framework that this is like this because the fundamental structure is like this. So if fundamental structure makes a loop, we feel unhappy. And this is one loop that I explained to you. You see, phenomena of loop in concepts is a new phenomenon. So mathematicians have not completed this loop yet. Okay? It is the problem of how to match the things when you have loop in concepts. Okay? I told you about this loop in concepts in order to do to, to do you to say what okay that besides this loop in concepts that is something like bv language Okay, I need to clean board. Sorry, and, and the, I just didn't understand what, what what the point you were stressing. I just didn't understand it. What, what loop of concepts? Where did we return? Concepts was we start okay from sets. From sets we go to a manifold. Okay. Yes. From manifold we go to the category of manifolds. Mm -hmm. From category of manifolds we go to differential graded category. From differential graded category, we went to A infinity category. From A infinity category, we went to non-commutative homological uh, vector field. Then we embed non-commutative homological vector field into homological supercommutative vector field. And we, fo and we found ourselves back to manifolds. We wanted to get rid of manifolds, replacing them by categories, redefining the notion of the object, mm -hmm. redefining the notion of the point, of a figure, of everything. And we thought that we are making progress, okay? So while we think we are making progress, we finally are back. 
So now we need to understand this loop in reasoning. Once again, DG categories lead to A infinity, A infinity lead to L infinity, and we are back to the manifold. So the question, what is the fundamental structure in mathematics? We don't understand. Either we should characterize manifolds or DG categories by some, times, by, by some type of hierarchy. But it's not a loop. That is something like this, with something like a complexity here. But I don't see any complexity here. At least an example. There are many manifolds, like a points, or uh, several points joined together, where functions, homological vector fields, everything is finite dimensional. So this loop saying that manifolds inside categories, categories, categories inside homological vector fields, and the homological vector fields are inside manifolds. It's a loop of uh, our search for fundamental structure. It's a novel thing in mathematical thinking. We are, we are going to fundamental objects and we are coming back. You see, I consider this as a mental, mental problem. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not mathematics already. We can make all these errors. It's kind of philosophy. What do we mean by understanding? And of course, it's not just blah, blah, blah. There are examples, okay? Can I ask the question? Of course. Uh, you started from physics. Do we have the analogies of this concept in physics? It's a good point. You see, quite recently, Namely, yesterday, I kind of accomplished a program in physics. So I was thinking about bosonic string theory and uh, string field theory. That is supposed to be gravity with corrections, okay? And what we know? We know that bosonic string theory is considered as a world sheet theory. And we should treat it in terms of quantum field theory. Then, then we go to the string field theory. And it turns out that I have a conjecture that almost any quantum field theory could be a string field theory. So here again, I have a loop. Quantum field theory is made out of strings. String is based on the quantum field theory. Another loop of reason. And I was hit by this loop. And that is exactly what I was telling to Pasha before we started the recording. I told Pasha that very standard lattice definition of the quantum field theory that is, of course, finite dimensional definition may be understood conjecturally in terms of the string field theory. But then we have a loop. What is made out of what? Quantum field theory is made out of strings or string is made out of quantum field theory. We have a loop. So this loop 
was the issue of the so-called bootstrap program of Joe in the 60s. When people were trying to understand what is made out of what, and they failed to understand, because there are Amazons, Hadrons, you know, all these gadgets. And uh, you may see one object as a pool and the scattering of another object. Just imagine, you just believe if you never followed the uh, quantum field theory of 60s. Okay, I'm not that old uh, to observe it, but I see these ideas that are spread in the air like, you know, pr primordial irradiation is spread in our universe. It hits us. So the same way, ideas of the 60s when I was born and could not observe them are still in the air of concepts, okay? So there was an idea that everything is made out, out of everything. Similar idea is in mathematics where uh, you don't have a fundamental object in the category of shifts, of complicates of shifts. You can start with the any object called primary, then uh, you can make a complex of uh, these primary objects, take morphisms, and you can generate any shift. And the idea is that there is no primary object. Or you can take different objects as a primary object. So everything is made out of everything. So we used to think that uh, all shifts are made out of vector bundle. Not necessarily. In the category of shifts, there are tricks that you should, you, you, you should not necessarily start from vector bundle. Moreover, as we know from the mirror that we discussed with Dong, vector bundle on the mirror could go to a point. So what is the source of everything? And the same thing happens in the so-called membrane theory. So maybe you have heard about deep brains. Maybe you heard colloquiums. So deep brains is something that, that is spreading uh, some submanifold in the space. And besides deep brains, there are empty deep brains. And there is a bound state of D brain and anti D brain that is brain of lower dimension. And this thing exactly reproduces idea how skyscraper can come from the complex of vector bundle. So lower dimensional brains could be made out of higher dimensional brains, brains at the same time, higher dimensional brains. So when you do mirror, then brains that uh, wrap big submanifolds go to brains that wrap small submanifolds. You have democracy. You cannot say what is made out of what. Everything is made out of everything. And it is hard to keep it in your brain that everything is made out of everything. Okay? So, now I need to make a break because I was talking for almost 50 minutes and there should be breaks. And what I'll go to, to talk in the next, hopefully 40 minutes, is that uh, similar loop of reasoning happens uh, in the so-called BB language, okay? So basically, my talk was about loop of reason. And uh, this thing is one example. And BV language looks like another example. And third example is this uh, strings uh, versus field theory. It's a third example. So when I see several examples, I see this loop of reasoning phenomenon. Okay. That says that everything is made out of everything. Okay, so now we have a break.
eight minutes break, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. 
为啊，说这位同志啊，我们现在啊，开始今天下午的就是树林队学院啊，巡查整改情况的通报，还有一个就是我们学院的年终总结。Okay, maybe we can continue. Pasha? Uh, da. Maybe we should continue. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep the schedule. 
-hmm. So during the break, I was following idea of partial question about what is the simplest or simplest example. And I found that the simplest example of now not BV yet about the loop in thinking was created actually in the 17th century. Pasha, could you guess the name of a great mathematician of 17th century who was also a good engineer? who seriously questions, questions the issue that things are made of something. Hmm? It is a mathematician whom your father respects very much. And I started to respect too after I realized what he was saying, okay? You see, I am Tell I am us. talking in puzzles, okay? Yes, yes, you are. So this great mathematician was called Dizarc. So he was not doing uh, quantum field theory or, or, or particles because there was no quantum field theory, not even uh, quantum theory, not even... Uh, particles. By the way, I think it was mostly in the time of Newton. And he was actually fighting with Newton, but not on the scientific field, but on the battlefield. So uh, he made, he constructed the dump around La Rochelle, who was attacked by French Catholics, and who was supported by English military just to make something bad to France. And being an engineer, he made this dump. And uh, everybody could see the picture, very famous picture, uh, Richelieu on the dump around La Rochelle. And that is exactly the place where uh, Athos, Partos, and Deramis were fighting without good effect. And uh, probably other, other French nobles went there. But if I am not going to talk about this fighting. I am going to talk about the idea of duality that was uh, created by the Tsar. So actually, if you have a vector, This vector corresponds. So he studied three dimensions to the dual plane. So here I call these elements here F by equation. So it was this century, Grassmann was not even, uh, nobody thought about Grassmann. Grassmann would appear 200 years later. Okay, so people was, were thinking in dimension three. Now we can uh, think in higher dimensions. So what these are realized? He realizes that there is such a thing as projective, projective geometry. So in projective geometry, he said that this V corresponds to a poly. And this plane correspond to, to something like a line, actually a circle, I think.
And he was thinking in the following terms that it's a point that is coincident to this figure. So roughly speaking, it's like a circle. And this coincidence is given by this. So actually you can draw it in terms of a point being here. So in this correspondence, the dark correspondence, point corresponded to the figure. But he thought, what if you hear what if here you consider not a plane but a vector? If not. Then you have a plane, a point, a plane here. So it was actually what now we call the contravariant function. And, and actually here it was F naught in the plane of F. And this went into, of course, point V corresponding to the plane of V. So here we not define this plane, okay? So it's well-known example of duality. So actually he was thinking, he was realizing that it is crazy to think that uh, plane consists out of points because under this correspondence, point goes to a plane, plane goes to a point. We may call it democracy. And to being, and the notion of being included is reverted. So it's actually the first example. Later on, 200 years later, when we come to this poor counter, he said that lines, planes, uh, and points are not just figures, like for this arm, with the notion of coincidence. That plane actually consists out of points. Line consists out of points. So he came to this structure of something being constructing out of something, and this actually affected our understanding of what mathematics is. So we went away from design. So it is the first example, the oldest. However, there is a newest example. So this example is the simplest one. And the newest example Of course, it is the hardest one, okay? And this example is called M-theory. Because in, in M-theory, people were thinking about, okay, deep brains somehow made or governed by strings. Deep brains are governed. by strings. However, there is so-called S-duality that takes so-called D1 brain into a string. And if you do it, and if you do it, you will see that everything is changing. The strings are governed by D1 brains. So what is made out of what? We don't even know. Now, there is so-called 11-dimensional supergravity. It has so-called M2 brain. And string is made of this M2 brain wrapped around the circle. OK, so string comes out of M to brain. And there are a lot of 
confirmation to this. At the same time, this M2 brain sometimes could be understood as so-called D2 brain. And being a D2 brain, it is governed by string. So what is made out of what? We don't understand. This condition of being made out of something depends on parameters of the theory. So theory actually has parameters. When we change these parameters, in one region, we see that one thing is made out of another. In another region, this thing is reversed. So several years ago, I reformulated this S duality for mathematicians in the following way. So deep brains D brains were objects and strings are morphisms. And S duality is something that takes objects into morphisms and morphisms into objects. What a crazy transformation. The modern language of uh, category theory could not withstand this. You just don't understand how this could happen. So, if mathematicians think that they provide the proper language for M theory, their description should contain such transformation. It looks a bit stupid. However, just imagine that you have objects. And you have these morphisms, okay? Now you can do you can do something like Fourier transformation, or go to the dual graph. No, it's not Fourier. It has a name. Like I thought, it was called Abel transformation. So you have a graph like this. Then you go to the dual graph. So links go to vertices and vertices go to links. Okay. So actually, if you have one object and one morphism, this is duality looks very simple. So universal object, universal morphism. Go to the dual graph. S duality. So if you have seen such pictures or such constructions in some kind of mathematics, you might try to think that you can understand the mathematical structure of S duality and M theory, okay? And you can find the baby example of M theory phenomenon. Objects to morphism, morphism to objects, okay? The person who had formulated coherently and who can show that so-called M theory is a much more complicated, but basically the same thing, would get, would get the Milner prize. That is like 3 million US dollars.
for making or constructing mathematical structure relevant to understanding M theory. Huh? It's a good challenge. However, mathematicians are lazy to think in this terms. Okay, so from now I go to BV language. And once again, in trying to understand BV language, I will again get these loops of reasoning. Okay. And this is what made me a bit nervous while I'm preparing to this lecture. And that's why I decided to explain to you loops of reasoning phenomenon and not uh, start with the BV language. Because if you think a bit, you will see the loops of reasoning phenomena. So let me start quietly, okay? So there was a person called Batali. And together with Vilkavisky, Maybe like this. They were studying something like gauge symmetries of quantum field theory. And while studying this, they realized the following. They said, consider poly vectors. Okay. So how should how should we understand poly vectors? So differential forms. Let us understand differential forms in the language that I'll continue to poly vectors. Differential forms are functions of x mu psi mu when this is odd this is even and these functions could be expanded as f naught of x no I put not here plus f1 mu of x psi mu plus f2 mu nu of x psi mu psi mu plus etc. Please excuse me for writing things in coordinates. It's not because I don't know that there is differential geometry. It's because uh, this notation in coordinates may give you the feeling of what actually is going on. Okay? Otherwise, I would expect, oh, he doesn't know what differential form is. He is writing that coordinates. No. I know what differential form is. I am giving you an example to help you to feel what is going on. Okay? So these guys are differential forms in coordinates. And there is an important operator, D, the RAM. That is psi mu D over DX mu. Okay? Sum over mu. Here also, sums are implied. And if you apply this D to F, it would be exactly what differential the RAM does. Okay. What are the nice structures that you can, that you have here? There is an important thing that these functions 
f x mu psi mu form a supercommutative algebra. You can just multiply them. And this multiplication is known as external multiplication of differential form. And D is a vector field. So it is differentiation of the multiplication, as you can easily see here. Moreover, standard notation, where you don't write here psi mu, but you write here dx, comes from the fact that if you apply d to x mu, you will get psi mu. So uh, if you don't like these psi and you'd like to call it language that are used, that physicists are using, just look at it this way. And moreover, this object, f, belongs to what? belongs to the space of functions on what we call t shifted by one to x. These things are basically the same. This here t is a tangent bundle. And this differential graded algebra was very natural and people studied it and in the beginning of the 20th century. And they were happy that they could write down uh, differential equations in terms of this external algebra. So it is super commutative DGA. Now, Where Batalin and Wilkowski came from? Batalin and Wilkowski came from the following transformation. Somehow, maybe them, maybe some other people, but basically them realized that it would be nice to make Fourier. I think he's written like this. Okay, I always forget how to write this. Maybe this. Oh, you. Fourier. Fourier transform. What kind of Fourier transform do I mean? I mean the following. You take an so-called Bayesian integral over dx over d psi one d psi d. Then you take put here the following kernel. You see, since it's Fourier, it is like theta i, sorry, theta mu, psi mu. So it's canonical pairing. So theta belong to the object dual to psi. And you multiply. What should we expect from this observation? The result of this transformation is so called. Fourier transform function, F tilde. In analysis, people used to say that it was F tilde. That depend on X mu and theta with the lower index mu, okay? Psi is integrated out, theta stands here, and what we have here is Bayesian integral, okay? So it was discovered in the middle in the 60s or maybe 70s of the last century.
For that, we can again decompose. into something, once again function, plus something that has a vector index, plus something that has two vector indices. Once again, please, I understand differential geometry. It's only important to understand what's going on to write it down in coordinates. So these guys were called polyvectors. And of course, you can multiply them, understanding that theta is odd. And these polyvectors of course, belong to functions on what we call T star shifted by one X. Now, let us see what happens with the round differential. So everybody knows that uh, when you take Fourier transformation, multiplication goes to derivative. So the round goes to where? Note that we took the first order differential operator into the second order differential operator. And we are not surprised because we are, we are doing Fourier transform. And this thing is called delta BV because they somehow invented it. Now, you may think, why this thing is called by name of some physicists and not called by name of uh, some great mathematicians? Or you see, why mathematicians never wrote such, a, such an object before? Of course, you see, all phenomena have their reason, have their explanation. It's because in order to make this Fourier transformation, you need to pick up the measure on the space of psi. So they, they did write such a thing before. What? Just, they did write such a thing before. They just called it to the different letter. Uh, good, Pasha. So. History is also important. So who wrote this before? And uh, it's important, you see, to know who invented Gauss, etc. Who invented this? If you know. No, the di divergence, but uh, I guess, yeah. Divergence, you see, divergence was on vector fields. Yes, right. So the key thing, I, I'll, go, I'll come to divergence. Mm -hmm. The key thing would be to continue divergence to polyvector fields. Mm -hmm. In order to continue to, poly, to polyvector fields, you need to understand, first of all, that polyvector fields are something that, uh, that should be multiplied. That, that, that they form an algebra. Multiplication of polyvector fields, uh, as far as I understand, uh, was not considered an interesting thing. For example, for vector fields, we know, we knew before that vector fields, so it's very natural. You have vector fields. What you can do with it? Ask any person from the differential geometry. He would immediately say, if you have two vector fields, you can only commute them because vector fields are infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. If you ask as a person that maybe we should 
multiply them using wedge product, he would probably ask you why we should uh, even dare to do this. However, I will describe uh, related uh, constructions. You see, that's why people call it this way. And, uh, and as Pasha explained, if you apply this object, so first of all, you can apply this to what? You can apply this to function. You get zero. Okay. You can apply this to f mu theta mu of x. And we know that this is a vector field. Okay. You take derivative, you get d mu f tilde mu. And of course, you know that this thing is not invariant with the under the change, change of coordinates. However, you are not surprised because you already have seen that this is a measure. So things should depend on the top form. So you can easily see that this is LV applied to the top form divided by the top form if the top form is point white non degenerate. Really, example, you have dx1, blah, 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 dx, d. Vector field takes x mu to x mu plus epsilon v mu, or, okay. So now I call this v. So at the mu's place, the dx mu goes to what? dv mu over dx mu, dx mu. And it's the only thing that we, are, that we take care of because other d's would cancel. And we need to sum over all places. So we actually see this formula. And of course, people know this formula from uh, analysis. So this was known. So that's why people know this as a divergence of the vector field. Because the divergence of the vector field entered, of course, in equations of mathematical physics. In particular, in physics of the beginning of the 19th century, People thought, people were thinking about so-called currents, okay? You see, current means that something flows, right? So what people were thinking is flowing. They were thinking that the particles are flowing. And flowing particles were understood as currents. So of course it was a vector. At the beginning, it was space-time vector. Space vector. So it was the flow of particles. Then they said, oh, this is a vector. And then they said, what is the divergence of this vector? It could be different. If you flow from some place and you go away, you have, you have non-zero divergence. However, then they realized that this divergence 
of particles. Actually, they prefer to study not particles themselves. They prefer to study charged particles. So here I put elementary charge E. You see, just consider particles going somewhere. And they said, look, at a point is changing. So the only way to take a charge out of some region is to flow away. So, uh, so they actually, it was something like a row. It is a density of charge. And people knew this as a conservation law. If we go to so-called special relativity, and we identify that time and space is the same, they said that uh, this vector, that is called space-time component of current, and rho, the density of charge. So it is, people used to call it as a four vector, J nu. Satisfied this equation. And it said that uh, charge could not uh, appear instantly. Charge could appear only if it flows in. So people understood this as a conservation of uh, current and uh, many other things. Water that flows away, something that goes away. That's why they were thinking about these currents as a four vectors. And this condition is well known. They also had this condition for uh, electromagnetic field, of course. Divergence of the field E in the vacuum, okay? Plus d phi over dt equals to zero. So phi was potential. E was uh, electric field. So how we know this? We know this is a definition of potential. So I'm telling you physics, okay? So people knew the notion of divergence, especially in this form. Okay. So of course they knew. That, uh, so if you look at the Feynman lecture uh, in physics, you will see divergence there. And people were writing down Maxwell equations, of course, in terms of divergence. So they knew what divergence of the vector is. They call it D. It came out very naturally. However, they had no physical picture for polyvectors. There was no process when you had these polyvectors. No physical process. That's why they never started it. So first of all, it was unnatural. And uh, from the point of view of differential geometry, it is unnatural. From the point of view of physics, it had no example. Okay. Nevertheless, this crazy idea to generalize divergence to polyvectors could be understood using this Fourier transform. However, you may say that Fourier transform comes out only after Berezin invented his integral. But it could be discovered before. Let me call it pole, polyvector. You can contract polyvector with the top form. And to get 
the form omega. You could do this. And then you have correspondence between poly vectors and omega. And you may ask, what corresponds to D omega? And you can easily check that it is exactly this. So to write down this, To write down this, you do not need Fourier transformation of Bayesian. You do not need any coordinates. The only thing you need is the understanding that there should be poly vectors, and you should be able to contract them with the differential forms, and in particular with the top form. Nobody invented this operation. There was a person who was very close to invent this operation. And his name was Hodge. So Hodge act actually discovered the D star operation. That turned out very important in the uh, theory of Maxwell equations. However, Hodge operation was something like this. Psi nu, I write down it in components. G mu nu plus maybe some other term. Okay. However, the symbol was like this. Hodge operate, operation was acting between differential forms and differential forms. It just lowers the degree. However, these were forms, and that contained metric. Would Hodge, and of course it was not invariant because it contained metric. All right? So it was operation on differential forms containing metric. Nobody was thinking about uh, polyvectors at that moment. Would somebody realize that this object may be rewritten as D theta mu, they would discover BV. Just uh, you see, metric, do, uh, metric identifies T star and T, but it, but it never happened, okay? So anyone could do it. But nobody did it. Anyone could do this thing, but it happened that nobody did it. And only it's only when Batarin and Lukavisky studied some physical systems, they realized that uh, this is the proper formula. You see, it's like uh, Bayesian integral. Everybody could do it. It's very easy. But nobody did it before Bayesian. So we have this delta BV that, and we need to remember that this delta BV depends on the top form, like here. And this is the second order operator. And for vector fields, it goes to the vector. Now, There was a second discovery of Batalin and Vilkarisky. So Batalin and Vilkarisky somehow knew that physicists were studying this.
in the limit h calls to zero. Actually, they studied this in the following form. So let me put limit in the equation mark. So physicists studied this object where h is very small. You cannot take a limit. However, I was telling you that uh, if you consider tropical geometry, you can do it, but it was later. Okay. So what did they start to study? They, they started with the following thing. Suppose we take functional integral. Okay. And suppose we integrate over y, whatever this means. Then everybody knows that as a function of x, you will get e to the s so called induced or affected of x and h that may be and s induced may be considered as element of function of x times the formal power theory in h and this transformation was known as a Feynman integral. And being a physicist, they knew that there is such a transformation. And they knew the following, <clears throat> that if you decompose S of X, Y in the following form, consider S2 of X, that is quadratic form on Y. plus S3 of X, that is a cubic form of Y, etc. Then if you integrate, then S induced would, would take the following form. It, is, it would be given by a graph where here you will have S2 minus one, just assume that S2 is non-degenerate. And here you will have S3, S3. So you will have graphs of this type. And actually we'll have a sum of the graphs And this graph was come to the factor H and here is the number of loops that equals to two, two loops. So things here are called loop expansion. And uh, if there is also the object that is called S1 of X linear object, you could have linear vertices. So people knew it in the year 19. 49 on the marvelous conference in the United States, Richard Feynman presented these diagrams saying that from these diagrams, you can easily see the scattering of elementary particles. So this particular diagram was an easy way to see how electron and photon and he wrote these pictures. A scattering. And this line from infinity corresponded to electron 
And that solves the classical equation of motion. It was called the plane wave, or as ph physicists call it, on shell. The same with the photon. And here, it was and this thing that actually corresponded to S2 minus one was interpreted as so-called virtual electron that goes around trajectories. And that's why it forms this S2 minus one. And this picture, became the main picture in theoretical physics. When people were thinking about scattering of uh, particles, they were thinking in terms of these graphs. And when they were thinking about edge corrections, they had similar graphs with loops. Let me give you a remarkable, a remarkable graph. That is not just a graph. This graph actually reproduces physical phenomena. So what I see here, I see here two photons colliding and not passing through each other as we used to have, but creating what people are called, you see this box diagram. And here we have electron that goes all the way around. And these photons go away. And you can compute this diagram and see how light and light, it's what's called scattering of light over light. It's a remarkable phenomenon. You can compute it. It is small because, of, okay, electron, mass of electron is small. However, it depends small with respect to what? Mass of electron is small with, the mass, with respect to mass of proton. However, due to the Einstein formula, E equals M electron C square, since C square is big, the energy of electron is typically bigger than the energy of photon that you are producing. And that's why in ordinary life, you never see this. However, when you have harder and harder photon, in physics, harder means more energy. You start to see this contribution and you see how light scatters on light. Okay, nice physical phenomena. Diagram like this, how electron is scattered with a photon. Diagram like this, like photons are going around. So that's what physicists knew. That's why Batalin and Yukavisky, being physicists, know that uh, they should better consider not Feynman formula, but formula of the following type. Like if you want to describe photons after you integrate out, as physicists say, after you include the reaction with electrons. In physics, people knew this formula. They knew that you should consider action, action Maxwell, that is quadratic, as you know, F star F, plus some crazy action, f to the power four, here you divide by mass of electron, I don't remember on which power, something like that. Effective action, knowing this action, you know how photons would scatter. Here is f to the four, so you have this so-called effect effective vertex for scattering of photons. So that's what Bataille and Elkanisky knew. Like everybody knew it after the year 1949. However, they studied it as a mathematical problem. And they said, 
we don't know what is the fundamental structure of uh, matter. What kind of physics do we have? Uh, higher particles, we don't know them. But we want to compute so-called soft physics. What would happen if we scatter particles of low energies? It's better to study this. And they study this object. And then they found a remarkable. But it's not the only thing that they studied. They studied this object. Then they decided to do the following. They replaced S of X by S of X theta. Pasha, you, yes. you, you had to stop me. <laughs> because I was speaking for 15 minutes. So now we will have a five minute break. Eight okay. minute break. Uh -huh. So when when is the, the, the cutoff? Where is what? Cutoff. So uh, we will have uh, five minutes, uh, seven minutes break, and then I'll uh, speak for 40 minutes. OK, OK. Mm -hmm. Because it's what actually happened. I trying to speak 40 plus 40 plus 40. <laughs> However, I'm speaking 50 plus 50 plus 50. Still, I want to explain to you motivations, not constructions. You see, construct you see constructions are like constructions. You do this, you do that, you get the result, but you don't understand the, the origin of the construction the limitation of construction, how to generalize it. Andre, okay, so if you want me to be the time policeman, so, so let's, let's, let's make the break then. Yes, mm -hmm. please be a time policeman. Uh -huh.
Okay. Pasha. As a policeman, do you let me in? Yes. Uh -huh. <clears throat> let me try to explain how they managed to get this understanding that you should go from s of x to s of x and theta okay why it was them who discovered it and why other peoples and why other people never discovered it okay then you will try to understand the logic and consequence consequences They did it trying to understand the following thing. Systems with symmetry. So, okay. You have this action. Nice. You understand that due to some reason uh, you have to generalize it to this form. Also nice. And this H contributes to loops. Now in the now starting from the year something like 1953, maybe one, there was a young Mills theory. And uh, when it was Young Mills theory, it was considered unphysical due to several reasons. Main reason is that this theory contained uh, light particles like photons that we never see. So people forgot about it. And they were doing this masons until approximately the year 1970, approximately around this. And here, several people contributed. So one of the persons who contributed to this resurrection was uh, Higgs and other people. They said that this theory could be made physical or corresponding to our observables if you have so-called Higgs phenomena that I don't want to discuss right now. It mean it meant that you take this young Mills, you couple it to some scalar field that is charged, then the expectation value, then this scalar field has an expectation value. This makes these massless fields massive. And that's great because uh, it explained the world of uh, so-called weak interactions very nicely. So as you know, Higgs phenomena was, uh, was appeared in 1964. And then people, start, people got some interest to this. Because it's not, it was not mathematics, it was physics. You are not doing theory if it definitely contradicts to your, law, to your world, okay? At least in these years, people were thinking this way, that uh, experiments and the world around us teaches us what to do. You see, this modification was done not because they just decided to promote this formula to this formula. It's because uh, it explains physical phenomena. Similarly here, people got new interest in young Mills theory. And uh, 
people use it, Young Bill theory is so called gauge, gauge theory. Like Maxwell. So, in the case of Maxwell theory, you have potential and you can change it to the total derivative. People knew it, of course, but they were not very interested in this. So, they did not need it actually in computation in describing physical phenomena. And nobody was in these years studying phenomena uh, that was not uh, of physical interest. So some people did, but they were considered as marginal, of course. Because there was a lot of things to study. So uh, for young beans, there was a similar, similar phenomenon. So it's because this took value in the algebra. And here we have this commutator in the algebra. I would better write it in this way. A, B, C, F, A, B, C. Okay, system with symmetries. And uh, people realized that the action of young mills is invariant with respect to the symmetries. And we have to deal somehow with the theories with symmetries. And people said that, okay, we need to do gauge fixing. And when people started to do this gauge fixing, they realized that it is important to introduce another field that you don't see. That is called ghost. This ghost field was actually the field theory version of the Chevalier generator of the Chevalier complex of 50s, but people completely missed this fact. So they rediscovered all this. So there were symmetries, they people, people had to do this gauge fixing. And, uh, and what happened? People had to replace this Lagrangian. Okay, I still call this X. In physical application, this was connection A, but I'll denote it as X. And there were also this ghost field C. And there are some other fields. I'll call them X tilde. So it was something. And they had to integrate here. So they started to study these systems. And also they were interested not only on the gauge symmetries, but also on so-called global symmetries. So first, they reproduced this Chevalier element because of the gauge symmetry. But then they started to think. How do we describe symmetries? And uh, finally, they realized that they should consider the following object, where C corresponded to symmetries. And they had to do some integral. Then I don't even understand how Battalion and Wilkowski realized the following. For me, it's a miracle. I don't know how to explain it. They understood that we need to promote this S here from functions to polyvectors.
This is one thing. Second thing, they realized that on pulley vectors, not on pulley vectors, that on so the pulley vectors are of course fields of this space. That here and actually times T star of one of I'll write it better like this. The algebra shifted by one. So that this is odd symplectic magnitude. Okay, it's star shifted by minus one in standard conventions. Sorry? It's the star shifted by minus one in standard conventions, if uh, you want. Uh, you know I like the two. Yes, but then then it's PT star. If you if you are writing some numbers, some integers in brackets, then you're actually talking about grade Z grading. Okay. So last time I asked, okay. So I am asking, I'm always asking conventions on conventions. Okay. So they realize it's an odd symplectic manifold. And they also discover that integrals that people are taking in the so-called gauge fixed theory, the integrals are integrals over Lagrange sub multi Lagrange, Lagrange sub manifolds. How did they manage to get it? I think by considering examples. That's how they get it. However, if you know, however, if you know that you go to poly vectors, then you see that forgetting theta is a, is a Lagrangian uh, submanifold that X belongs to T star of X as a Lagrangian submanifold. That's what you would know. Okay. So this integral. Is a particular uh, is a particular case of integration of a Lagrangian submanifold. So it's hard to reconstruct their logic since there are not mathematicians. However, mathematician would uh, say that's what mathematician would say that. That this object, now I put here theta. Okay. Is also a polyvector. All right. And I could make Fourier transform out of this. Fourier. Namely, consider S, namely, consider just Fourier transform of everything, not of S, of everything. How to call it? Let me call this F. 
Okay. Now due to fiber that you may, you may consider F tilde. That would depend on X mu and Psi mu because you're doing Fourier transform. And this is already a differential form. And you may ask if the differential form is closed. Okay. And then you may say, here are the integrals of the over the range multiplier. And remember, I told you before. That you can uh, decompose this. You can have two types of fields. Okay, x, psi, x, c, and some field y. And you could even do the following. You can have x mu, theta mu, psi, c, c so called star. This is analog of, analog of theta. And also y and y star. So this y star is like theta here. I can call this theta x. Maybe it's better to call it this way. Theta y. And <laughs> consider this full guy before integral i as a differential take so if this is i then i tilde is a differential form And since you are taking here some integrals, it means that you are taking here an integrals of the differential form. Huh? And you know that if you are taking integrals of the differential form, it should be the direct image along the cycle. And this is something that mathematicians know. That if you have differential form, you can take uh, the direct image along the cycle. So consider this thing as, uh, as something on the vibration. So here you have this xc if you wish, and here you have y. And you integrate over the cycle. It's interesting to, uh, to see that integral of a cycle corresponds exactly to the integral of a Lagrangian submanifold. It's very non-trivial, but you can understand this. That when you integrate over the cycle, you impose conditions like f of y equal to zero, and of course, df of y equal to zero. So these are equations on the cycle given by the function f. So these are equations that lower your dimension. So this lower dimension of y, here number of y goes down by one, and here number of psi corresponding to y goes down by one. So here we have one less coordinate, here we have one less psi. However, when you make the Fourier transform, here you are growing in dimension and not going down. It's a property of Fourier transform. So reasoning this way, you may understand 
that cycle that you are integrating over differential form comes to Lagrangian submanifold. This D, the RAM, goes into delta BV. And you will may study the Fourier image of, of the of the push forward. So it means that you impose condition that delta BV So you actually would like to say that since that if this thing is closed, then integral of a Lagrangian cycle in the Y space It is, of course, e to the s induced of x theta x h over h is annihilated also by bv. So here you have delta BV on X times Y. And here we have delta BV on X. So if this is zero, then this is zero. Direct image in the very weird situation. So if you ask me how a person could get this, could guess this, I would say, it is absolutely unclear how anyone could, could guess this, especially since physicists had new idea about uh, differential forms and direct images. Absolutely no idea. So when Battalion in the 70s were coming out with his polar vectors and integrals of a Lagrangian submanifolds, People considered him as being completely crazy. Nobody was able to understand, to understand him. Nobody, and you see why. In order to understand this, you need to know the following. The poly vectors are coming out of, are related to differential forms. That on differential forms, you have the push forward that uh, close things goes to close things. That Battalion Lutkowski is actually a free image of Dirac. That Lagrange submanifolds correspond to cycles. You had to know in advance many things. Of course, physicists never knew that. But mathematicians were also not very interested in such structures. However, Some time passed, and people decided to study Battalion Wilkowski closed equation. Namely, they started to study what does it mean to be closed in Battalion Wilkowski sense? What does it mean? So you just need to take, you need to apply this operator here and expand in H. And it's easy to see
that this is equivalent to this. And this is called main equation. I was trying to motivate why this equation was important. How to understand it from the point of view of differential forms. However, if we agree to study this equation, we will get a new clues on why this equation is interesting. Let us see what stands here. Here I have poly vector, okay? Here is a bracket on poly vector. Some people call it BV bracket. However, the proper name for this bracket is Schutton's bracket. I, I, I always forget how to call, how to write it, but at least I mentioned short on the bread. So so this mathematician studied natural operations on tensors, and he found that if you consider poly vectors just as a game, then there is a bracket on them that is invariant under diffeomorphism. Roughly speaking, in coordinate, it is Poisson bracket. And you can define this bracket not necessarily necessarily on the same S, you can define this bracket on say S1 and S2, on two polyvectors. And to show it, I just call them P polyvectors. And this is invariant. However, this of course depends on the top form. This is divergence. Now people start to be interested in poly vectors. What does this mean? First, people start with the classical limit. H going to zero. Then they found interesting equation. Called classical master equation. Great. What is the geomet now let's see what is the geometrical meaning of this classical master equation. Let us consider, consider once again several particular cases. Case A. S is the function. Then this equation is trivial. No restriction on functions. And of course, uh, it corresponds to our knowledge that when we take this functional integral of s of x, we did not apply any equations on the function s of x. Now consider the case B. S is a vector. So actually, for S to be a vector, it is better to do the following. Okay. So is a vector actually means 
that if you consider differential operator that corresponds to this vector, remember, there was what I call theta mu v mu of x, yes? If this thing is even, the total thing, then v mu of x d over dx mu is odd. By the way, it is another reason why people have not studied this object. Because would x be only even? You, you can never get odd vectors. So this became interesting only when you introduced uh, Fadeev Popov, or actually Chevalier Ghost. So when I say that this is odd, it means that some axes are even, some odd. Then in this particular case, in this particular case, S S equal to zero for a vector corresponding to a vector means that you have so-called homological vector field. And there are more interesting generalizations corresponding to polyvectors. Interesting case C. If S is a bivector, then this is a Poisson condition. So actually, a lot of information could be captured in this equation. And uh, now it's no time to study, to explain these examples. I will explain them tomorrow, case by case. I would like to conclude what I say today by the terrible announcement. And this terrible announcement, terrible announcement is the following. It will take 10 minutes and uh, you will not be able to understand what I mean, but maybe you'll remember the idea. Consider the A infinity algebra. It's a question why you should consider it, but just imagine that you consider the A infinity algebra. It's a set of operations mu2, mu3, etc. It could be obtained from the differential graded category. And we call it mu. Actually, the mu is, could be made into non-commutative factor field. Now, theory of deformation of A infinity algebra. Hmm? So A infinity algebra actually means that mu, mu, and this is called Gerstern Haber bracket equals to zero. And by the way, Gerstern Haber just recently got a very prestigious mathematical prize. He is still alive. It's good. Theory, theory of deformation mean that you say that mu goes to mu plus delta mu. 
moduli natural symmetry that delta mu is equivalent to delta mu plus once again this Gerson Haber bracket G times some U. So in the linear order. You have cohomological problem where this bracket is a differential. And you know this differential has a name. It's called Hochschild differential. I think it's written like this. And the formation space is Hochschild cohomologies of A infinity algebra. By the way, who is interested in Hochschild cohomologies of A infinity algebra? It is some, something very abstract. You don't even think that you care about this. However, there is a Hochschild constant Rosenberg theory. So that's saying if A infinity algebra is not just an algebra. but comes from associated commutative multiplication then Hochschild cohomology are isomorphic to polyvector field on the spectrum Corresponding to associative commutative algebra of this algebra. Ah, so polyvector fields naturally come in the very abstract theory of deformation. And if you study deformation of Foucault category, of course you will see that. Okay, so it was a linear thing. Now let us see what comes at quadratic level. And on the quadratic level, there is an obstruction. Obstruction to deformation on quadratic level. Huh? Battalion Wilkowski master equation got a new insight. They are coming from the theory of deformation of infinity algebra from the very different source. But once again, this is uh, only a classical theory. And we expect something like this. This is called quantum main equation. And most probably, This should come from non commutative delta BV applied to mu plus 
не умел герцог Хаджи. А! You may call this perturbative quantization of a infinity theory. So what is delta BV in terms of mu? So mu, of course, is an operation. It is non-commutative, that's why I put here lines. And delta BV means you take this line, take this line. This is delta BV. And that is how we are coming to delta BV. That's how we lift delta BV. So moral is that polyvector fields are fluctuations of uh, A infinity algebra near associative commutative thing. BV equations BV equations is the second obstruction. So that is how what people are calling field theory comes together with the abstract algebra. Fields are nothing but uh, fluctuations of A infinity structure. And later we will see that equations of motions could be written down as BV equation. So this is one of the way where I'm pointing to. And it's possible to quantize it. So I'll say more about BV tomorrow. So now it's time for equations. In my understanding, BV structure should require uh, sort of top forms, right? Of course. Yes. Yeah, so, so I don't think every A infinity algebra has a analogy for BV operations. Maybe there should be some sort of isomorphisms between Hochschild homology and Hochschild cohomology. Isn't that so? It is before Hochschild homology and cohomology. It is, if you can, this uh, top form actually comes from the fact that you understand A infinity algebra as a multilinear operation. If you have multilinear operation, it means that you have a linear structure and that's why you have this analog of the top form. So, would you study something more general, namely, would you study this mu as a internal uh, formal vector? You would like to say that this decomposition into operations comes after we choose a local coordinate on the formal non commutative disk. So it means that we should think about A infinity algebra and its quantization as something and as a homological field on the non-commutative disk equipped with the top form on a non-commutative disk. But when you speak in terms of operations, you already have chosen this. You have already chosen linear structure and in particular this top form. That's why when you have this linear operation, there is no problem in taking a trace. 
the only problem could be if this space is infinite dimensional. But if everything is finite dimensional, it's not a problem. Dong. Can we do it even without the pairing? <clears throat> yes. Okay. And uh, it would be an it would be an example that we will consider tomorrow. Moreover, this equation could be also considered as a limiting equation in, inside special L infinity. And I will also describe this tomorrow. It's called met so-called matrix model. Mm. I'll explain. You see, I just don't want to rush in here because I actually consider this very important. You see, it's, it's a basic thing. And that's why it's good to understand uh, how they came out, what they mean in particular case, what they mean in general, what you can do with it. Okay. L let us discuss it. And here it's a place where we have a loop. That in all this category business, we are coming again to an object, to a, to a non-commutative disk. We start from categories, and we are back to vector field. This is the loop that I started from. So you just said that if I trying to write down infinity relations in coordinate, then it's kind of implicitly It's choosing. a question what we call by infinity. If it's a relations for operations, they are already yeah. in coordinate. Oh, I see. Uh, that you said that it's kind of like choosing a top four. It's right. Uh, so, so, so we're not stronger. What we say is a set of linear operations. It yes. already means that we are right, that we written them in coordinate. Because it's a question of how do you call formal non commutative disk? Okay, I see. I got it. Got it. <laughs> you either have it in coordinates or in coordinates co uh, equivalent with respect to non commutative diffeomorphisms. To write down operations, you need coordinates. Somebody said that that's actually stronger than just choosing a top form? Uh, yes, uh, you're putting coordinates there, right? So putting coordinates yes, is so stronger than top This form. way, you are putting ah. a coordinate. There are natural symmetries of this that are formal non-commutative divergentless diffeomorphisms okay. of non-commutative disk. But they have to be divergentless. I see. Thank you. I, I, I was a bit confused because, you know, I it, the BV operators I know is uh, from Calabria manifolds, and it's kind of quite restricted cases. So at first I was uh, I didn't understand how every infinity algebra can have BV. Uh, it is because the disk is, is also a Calabria manifold. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when people were dealing with Calabi Yao manifold, they were thinking mostly about compactifications of string theory. Yes. Compactify, you mostly study compact things. Yes. You see, the same thing happened in differential geometry. When people started differential geometry, they kept in mind something like a sphere that was compact. However, later on, in differential geometry, people uh, okay move to non-compact spaces, and actually, in algebraic geometry, people move to a fine manifold. But then you have a problem: how to glue them? It's another interesting issue. So, a infinity structure is something on the formal disk. That is definitely an affine manifold. It's a spectrum of the formal series. In non-commutative coordinates. 
I see. You got it. However, people think about even more complicated structures. Just imagine, not just this, the formal disk. Just imagine something like non-commutative, non-commutative manifold with the homological vector field on it, whatever this would mean. And just consider uh, singularities, oh, sorry, uh, zeros of this field. And in each zero, you can get this infinity structure. And then the issue that, uh, that Shelley uh, pointed out, and I also was thinking this way, but Shelley told it to me and not I to Shelley. That's why I have always to mention him. Uh, that uh, we don't understand, we don't quite understand non-commutative world. But imagine that we have non-commutative manifold, whatever this would mean. We have non-commutative vector field, whatever this would mean. And imagine it, uh, it has several zeros here and here. And we have a infinity structure here. And we have another a infinity structure here. How they are related? So it is a little bit like story about modular forms. You know, you have a modular form on the modular space. At, at one cusp, you can expand it. You have some nice combinatorics. At another cusp, you expand it. You have another combinatorics. These combinatorics are related by analytical continuation. And they are called the, you know, strange relations between partition functions for different things. So this non-commutative supermodular space, do you know how to look at it? It is something like modular space of, okay, I say background. Here you have strings of type one, not A, B or something, and A infinity algebra corresponding to the strings. Here we have another string. So it's exactly the picture where you have something and you have at cusps string theory and very non trivial relations between them. So it's again picture from something like chem theory. But in, uh, in homological algebra, you need to imagine just this, I don't know, universal, uh, non-commutative, super manifold, whatever. Okay, I think now Pasha signals me. No, I, I, I'm, I'm just saying bye-bye. So thank you for your, for your lecture. Oh, okay. just, uh, it's it's no, a bad time for me. So let us continue tomorrow. No, you, uh, sorry, it's 5 a.m. here. <laughs> but thank you. Okay, so see you tomorrow. Maybe there are some other questions. We can discuss tomorrow. We can discuss right now. We can discuss whenever you visit. So I thought you were supposed to explain how this cubic terms, cubic terms, and in, uh, in this this uh, I forgot the this PCOV theory appears if you start to consider some sort of democracy of yes, the. You see, you see, uh, you see. In order to in order to explain this, I had to explain BV in general. Uh, so are we gonna uh, see that in, say that tomorrow or? I, I hope we will come to this tomorrow.
I see. I see. So then I oh, postpone. Uh, you question. see, I, I because because this is particular case of particular case. So tomorrow, so actually, what I'll explain tomorrow would be how to understand the higher operations in homological algebra from BV uh, in general, and in particular uh, the BCOV Feynman diagram. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah. Maybe I should leave the questions for tomorrow. Okay. Uh, what is what is the coordinates for the uh, non-commutative formal disk? For formal variables such yes. that uh, such that uh, x i x j is not related. To xj xi. Oh. So in supercommutative, they equal to each other with minus one to the parity. Right. And here they are related. And this could be achieved in terms of matrix model in BV that we will also discuss tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. So tomorrow you will finally see at the end the Feynman diagrams of BCOV. Okay. okay thank you. Thank you for the lectures. Okay. See you You're welcome. So, who is making a recording? Uh, me and also Donna. Yes. Donald, are you making. are you making a recording? Yes. Thank you, Donald. Please uh, stop the recording and send the links to Munov. Yes. It would be European. Yes, Once as there. always. <laughs>